This talk is titled From .NET Run to Hello World. Hopefully the title gives it away somewhat where I'm going with this. Um, but we'll, um, we'll the endeavour in 45-ish minutes to get through everything that the .NET runtime does from the point you type .NET Run to the point that Hello World is printed on the screen. And it's something that we take for granted. It's the first program we write. It's, you know, we're, we're running up code every single day, probably of our lives as developers. Um, but we maybe don't think about what's going on. And this talk is helping us think about that. Just a quick thing to say, first of all, this is a com company I work for. Um, they're very kind in letting me uh, and supporting me in doing things like this. But they do have a developer tool. Um, it's a security software. Uh, it analyzes your program in, in development and will report back on security issues. Um, one of the things for me that's interesting about it is that we get into the run internals of the .NET runtime, that's why I'm working there. And that's, for me, uh, jobs overlap with what I'm interested in, a bit of a chicken and egg. I like this stuff as internals and I get to do it as a day job and that's quite nice as well. But anyway, there's a bit of information if you want to look up about contrast there. Um, if this isn't being clear already, um, I love this stuff. Um, I always have to say I love it in a way not like I love my wife and kids or my family, but to me, uh, internals is interesting. The internals are the runtime, however you want to think about it, what's going on under the hood, um, what the CLR is doing for us when it runs its code, that really interests me. Um, I blog about it, um, I do talks when I can about it. Um, I don't know if everyone is maybe interested to that level, but I do find that people are interested in finding out about this stuff. Um, I don't know if it's like an engineer's mindset or it's natural curiosity or whatever, but I think we're all kind of interested in certain ways about finding out what's going on. We try not to just treat the runtime as a black box and say it's doing its thing. We dig into it in different ways. Uh, maybe another way we think about it is this. Understand one level below your usual abstraction. Now, we work at different levels, so we've just had a talk about the project system or the, the five minutes I saw at the end. Um, that seemed to be what it was about. No, I, I saw the abstract before. But anyway, there's different levels. We're not all working directly on top of the runtime day in, day out. And I suppose I should put a disclaimer at the beginning of this talk. Uh, it's unlikely that you'll see something in this talk and go to work tomorrow and instantly make lots of changes in your code base. Um, I reckon the good rate is if you, ha over the next year, if you remember something from this talk and it helps you out in your day job, that's probably a good rate. This stuff is not day in, day out. We're working at different layers. Sometimes we're working up in ASP, not ASP.NET level. Sometimes we're working on, on top of the base class library and system.collections, and that's our abstraction there. But sometimes we do dip down, don't we, into like having to know what's going on with the GC, uh, the JIT compiler, uh, the runtime in general, we want, might want to find diagnostics about it. We might want to, um, just for our own curiosity. So there's different levels, but this is kind of my way of justifying this sort of thing, um, is that actually I think there is some truth to this, that we should understand some level. Um, and I think as well it's probably good that this isn't all in the heads of Microsoft engineers who, who work on the runtime. I think there's some good, and now it's open source, a lot of this is a lot easier. So. We've always been able to look um, with Reflector into a certain amount of code in the base class libraries, you know, like system.collections and those sorts of things. But um, you come up a point where actually you can't go any lower. Um, but now we have the open source .NET Core CLR uh, up on GitHub. We can look into everything all the way down. We can see everything that's going on there. We might not want to. It's not always easy to find your way around, but in theory we can. We can take that code and build our own version of the runtime. We can do a lot of things with it. So um, this is going to simultaneously be the most boring and the most interesting demo you ever see. Yes. I didn't mess it up. I, I have actually messed that talk up, believe it or not. I saw that demo. I messed it up by not putting uh, my console on this display. So I was doing it, and I got the biggest round of applause I've ever got in my life. Joking aside, there's actually a lot going on there. The fact that I can actually fill a 45-minute talk with literally what we saw there between the time I typed .NET Run and Hello World. Uh, there's loads more. I've done another talk that's just the parts of the runtime where there's performance issues or where something's been done in the runtime to improve performance. That's another talk. And there's probably more and more um, bits that I don't even know about the runtime. So um, there is a lot going on there. There's probably um, millions of lines of code, potentially hundreds of thousands, certainly lines of code executed there. Um, there was um, lots and lots of bytes um, compiled, jitted. Uh, into machine code from uh, into, uh, IL code. There was, uh, and all the things that we see going on here. To give a, 
an idea of the outline where we're going for the rest of this talk. So we're going to look at what the runtime means to give some definitions, maybe to give an idea of how it's structured. Um, look at hosting it because something has to kick the runtime off to start it up. Um, how it initializes itself. Uh, the type loader because you can't get anywhere without li loading types. Uh, JIT compilation and at the end anything else or everything else that we get to. So the main components. This is some stats about the code. This is about a year and a half out of date. I keep meaning to update it, but it's on the end of a long list. Anyway, you can assume these numbers are bigger now, basically. There's a lot of uh, source code in there. Um, there's a lot of test code in there. Uh, there's actually um, not as much test as you maybe think because the tests in there just test the runtime. They structure things a bit differently now. So it used to be the core CLR repository was separate from the core FX, which is the base class libraries and the, the C-sharp code. Uh, now it's all under something called the runtime. So you go to github slash .net slash runtime, it's all there, but there's still this kind of um, split between the core part of the runtime and the base class libraries. So there's a lot more tests in the, in the core, in the base class libraries because a lot of that tests parts of the runtime, but there is specific tests in here that just test the parts, things that live in the runtime, which is things like reflection, which is things like type loading, which is things like uh, jitting. There's tests that test some of those things. Um, it's mostly C++ um, code. There is a bit of C-sharp code, and we'll go on to where that lives in just a minute. There's a whole bunch of IL because a lot of the things they do, they don't want to be reliant on a compiler, as, as good as a compiler is. They want to be able to uh, exercise parts of the runtime directly with IL, so they write a lot of tests in IL that way. Um, there's a bunch of assembler code again, we'll discuss that, and I've no idea what the Python and Perl, I'm pretty sure it's build scripts or uh, internal scripts on that. Certainly, I don't think any of the code that ends up in the runtime is Python or Perl. But this is just to give you an idea that the, the runtime is pretty big, pretty impressive, pretty... A uh, large amount of engineering has gone into it. The open source .NET Core runtime, whilst it you know, appeared to us uh, outside of Microsoft, um, it's come from the heritage of the .NET framework. Um, you know, there's commonality there. I believe there's, I think it came from Silverlight code base and, and then worked out that way because Silverlight was a lot more cross-platform. Um, but anyway, it's not come in isolation. So this is building on top of that. Some of this code is in there. Has anyone ever heard of uh, Rota? The SSCLI, it's the kind of, yeah, the op a few people nodding. It's the open source version of the .NET runtime from about 12 years ago, or something a long time ago, which you may not have heard of. But um, it was a release around .NET 1.1 and 2.0 timeframe. And it was a um, implementation of the .NET runtime. It wasn't the same as the version that we would have used, .NET framework. Um, it was similar. It was meant to be compatible, but they released it under an open source, um, shared source license. So it wasn't open source in the way we think about it nowadays in terms of contributing back, but you could go and take it. It was meant to make it available for um, academics mostly to, to do experiments. And there's some, been some research papers based on that where people have taken the source and then modified the GC um, or modified the JIT to, to try and do a piece of research. Um, the runtime, the reason I'm telling you about Rota though is that whilst the GC and the JIT are pretty different or very different than the ones in .NET Framework. The rest of the runtime is quite similar. And actually now you can go and look at the rotor source and look at the um, uh, .NET Core, you know, the open source version that's come out like five years ago, whenever it came out. And, and whilst the files are quite different, the file names are similar, the directory structure is similar, there's similar concepts in there. So when we're down at the internals that this talk is talking about, quite a lot of this stuff has actually been there since, you know, .NET 2, .NET 1 timeframe. Um, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight had to be there for, to run any program. Um, but we can, uh, we can see that it's come from that, that heritage. This is what it looks like a bit more visually. The size of the boxes are um, number of lines of code. Whether that means they're more complex or not is a different discussion. But anyway, number of lines of code. The colours don't really mean anything other than to distinguish them. Um, but the, 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 they're divided up, um, they're coloured in terms of the folder. And so this is the layout. So you could actually go onto the repository, um, except for the, the one we'll come to in a second, they've renamed. But anyway, you can go and look at there and you'll see these folders. And we're just going to talk through, because this is what builds up. This is what makes up the runtime. So MS Corelib is actually now called system.private.corelib. This is all the C-sharp code in the runtime. Um, there's a, a C-sharp DLL um, that ships with the runtime. And, and the reason that's there is because there's some APIs that are fundamentally tied to the runtime. So you think about system.gc, right? So the GC um, is one of the blocks in a second, but the GC is a fundamental part of the runtime. But we can control it, we can uh, query it, we can do a few things via the system.gc. 
So that, 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 that's one of the reasons why there's C-sharp code that comes with the runtime, because it needs to expose some of the C++ code, and it needs to be um, tight, you know, so that when they make a new API, they want to expose it that way. They have to have the same um, to, paired up. Uh, the other way is there's a rule with the runtime that it can't have a dependency on anything else. It has to be standalone. So any time that C-sharp code needs to use something, it has to be itself included in that c -sharp. It's a bit circular, but hopefully you understand. So like collections or things like that. Um, the other part, things that go in there is more fundamental data types, strings, arrays, the things that aren't really just implemented purely in C-sharp. Um, sometimes there's a duality, so there might be a, there's a strings.cpp, C++ file, there's a strings C-sharp file and the string type is implemented across the two. So some of the stuff exists as, as native, um, unmanaged in the C++, some of it is written in C-sharp. They're trying to write more and more in C-sharp, actually, interestingly enough, as they go along. Um, they're actually finding that in a lot of cases where it had to be written before in C++ for performance, it doesn't have to be written now. So if there's, you can actually go on the repositories and see where they're actually, because of maintenance uh, reasons, because of, you know, there's more C sharp developers, maybe than the C plus plus developers, because it's uh, easier to um, write memory safe and uh, or just generally safe C sharp code than it is to write C plus plus code. That's why they're moving away from it. So uh, it's quite an interesting um, fact that actually they're they're yeah the, where the the extreme they've taken to it is something called Core RT, the Core Runtime, which is a separate project, but they implemented almost all the runtime in C sharp in there. And that's uh, interesting to look at. That's more of a research thing, and they're not really shipping it as a product. Well, they've never said, Microsoft never said they're going to ship it as a product. But the idea in there is actually you can write quite a lot of a runtime in C Sharp. Uh, that's MS Core Lib. Um, so we're down there. That's the JIT compiler that's just been cut off in the corner. Um, that's the part that is responsible for taking the IL codes that we give it when we run um, and turning it into machine code for the um, CPU we're running on. So when we compile in uh, Visual Studio, VS Code, on the command line, however, we're compiling generally to IL code. Um, that's kind of a, looks a bit like assembly code, but a high level representation. Um, but that has to be turned into something that could be run on the CPU, and that's the job of the JIT. And that has to work across uh, all the different CPUs. So currently it's x86, x64, I think there's one or two of the ARMs in there. Um, and it's kind of growing since .NET Core has come open source, there's more you can, Raspberry Pis and all those sorts of things. So it has to deal with all that. Um, it's, it's a lot of, um, if you've ever looked at compilers, it does the same sort of thing. So it parses the IL, turns it into a, some sort of syntax tree, and then does optimizations. It wants to, um, there's very little optimizations done by the, the Roslyn or the, the, you know, at that time, the compiled code there. All the optimizations are done in the JIT. So it's, it, it's the, has the job of making our code run as fast as possible. Um, the GC, uh, garbage collector, is, is a standalone component. Uh, the most interesting thing about this is there's a single file, gc.cpp, that is 35,000 lines of code long. If you go and look at it, or at least recently, uh, till recently, if you went to look at it on GitHub, uh, it would refuse to render the file and says this is too big. Um, there's historical reasons why it's in one single file. Um, it certainly wouldn't pass any clean code or, um, you know, it wouldn't do well in those, those things. It's, it's, but anyway, that's what it is, um, but it works. It's, it clearly works because we're all running on top of it. Um, there's a few bits here. Um, that we'll go over really quickly. So if people have heard of SOS. Um, you might have used it with WinDBG. If you're debugging .NET code, have a few people heard of it? Um, bizarrely, the name stands for Son of Strike. Um, but anyway, this is the part of the runtime that lets you debug into the runtime from a native debugger. So native debuggers don't understand or uh, manage runtimes, right? They need to have something that sits in between. And that's the job of the code in the SOS. And the part at the top in purple is the data layer. So it provides a way for it, you know, given a .NET process, it'll say like, here's the data structure where you can find the list of threads or here's the data structure that starts to tell you about where the GC heap is and how big it is. So that's these, these components. And I put it in there because it's quite interesting to see there's a, there's a lot of code just, just to provide that. That powers the debugging experience as well when we step through all that sort of stuff. You know, the Visual Studio does quite a lot of work on debugging, but it hands off, to, it's kind of a protocol between the two, but it hands off to the runtime. 
Um, the PAL platform abstraction layer is, the job of that is for um, letting the runtime work across different OSs that have different file handling routines, that have different, um, that, that kind of thing. It abstracts it out. So the rest of the runtime can say, I'd like to open a file. And this part of the code deals with opening a file differently on Windows versus Linux or whatever. So that's what's going on there. Again, quite a lot of code to make that happen. Um, uh, this part in the middle is, in essence, the APIs of how the, all the different parts of the runtime talk to each other. So um, the GC, well, the, the VM, the big red block in the top left-hand corner is kind of the controller of everything. And it has an API to talk to the JIT, and the JIT has an API to talk back to it, the same with the GC, and that all sits in there. But it's also the external API. So I work on a tool, or have for several years worked on tools that use something called the profiling API. That's described in there. There's a debugging API, which any third-party debugger would use. The profiling API is used by probably any third-party diagnostic tools, uh, monitoring tools, those type of things. So there's APIs the runtime provides that enable the wider ecosystem to use. Um, and the VM is everything that's left. Um, and I'll describe it in a bit more detail in a second, but um, it also has a whole lot of per CPU assembly code. So at certain parts of the runtime, they drop down to handwritten assembly codes to get performance. And that's when we're talking about things like um, some of the write barriers that the GC uses um, when you're accessing arrays, certain parts that are kind of have to be as fast as possible. And what ends up in there? So. Lots. Type system, generics, all the built-in types, string, arrays, uh, delegates, and a few others. Um, loading of types and classes, all the threading goes on there, um, exception handling and stack walking. To give you a very quick idea of how complex stack walking is, I managed to write an 11,000 word blog post on just how stack walking is implemented in the runtime. It's, it's crazy. We just think, you know, we get our nice stack trace, we take it for granted. And if you've do, ever done C++ or other things where you don't always get a nice guaranteed stack trace, it's harder to work with. There's a lot going on there. And that's also built, that, um, that's intimately used as well, not just when we have the full stack trace, but just exception handling, how exceptions bubble up the stack, where they get caught, the unwinding, all the, all the stuff going on there. Very, very complex process. Um, event tracing, profiling, sort of, to, and, and p-invoke, that's one of the other parts. And I think the one I missed off the list is reflection, is, is sort of included in the runtime as well. Um, okay, so very quickly on hosting. Um, the runtime has to be hosted, right? So in, in .NET framework times on Windows, most version of Windows, you just double click your executable and it runs. But that's because there's a little shim built into the, to Windows. That's why in the .NET core world of cross-platform, we, we do .NET run or .NET execute or the different options there. We launch it. So whatever way it happens, either hidden from us or more explicit with .NET run, there's a hosting API. And it goes through these process, uh, it goes through these steps. And uh, at the end of that, you run the, run the, um, run the runtime, <laughs> run the runtime, execute the runtime. There's still app domains in .NET Core. There's one app domain, even though they're kind of hidden from us, they've been taken away. We can't create multiple app domains, but there's still the concept of an app domain. Um, but it goes through your steps. But let's just show, um, for the sake of having nice demos, let's just show you what this looks like. Um, actually, let's start with the code. Right, there's the code. You can now see it. Anyway, you can go on to uh, MSDN Docs on the URL I showed you before, and you can get this. It's about 100 and uh, 200 something odd lines, but it, it gives you a nice understanding of what the runtime is doing. It's initializing, it's starting up um, where it needs to look for all the DLLs it wants to load. Um, it needs to actually call into the runtime to say to the runtime, you initialize yourself. Um, and there's a whole lot of, uh, about, I can't remember now, I think it's a hundred odd steps. Anyway, there's a lot of things the runtime does on initialization. Um, it has to start up the first app domain, it has to point to your code. And just to prove that it does actually work, I will run up that demo. So we're just seeing, uh, you can see there, I'm just running up the sample host, which is the code in that uh, Visual Studio. And I'm just passing it the same hello world that I just ran a minute ago, the .NET Core one. And there you go. And the nice thing about it is that you can put your own ASCII art in and have <laughs> Matt's CLR, which is not true actually, it's Matt's hosting API wrapping around the CLR, but that's not quite as nice. But anyway, um, the, the point is, is that th this is uh, how the runtime starts up. Something needs to start it up. 
it's, um, it's an API. This is what um, is uh, SQL Server's using when it runs, if I think it still runs CLR code, um, but anything that's running the, um, anything that's starting up the runtime. But, it, but generally it's been hidden from us up until .NET Core is maybe a bit more obvious that we had to start it and with the .NET. So th that's the first thing, something has to start up the runtime. That's how it's initialized, it goes through these steps. If you've ever done any work with COM and these interfaces, you kind of have this ICLR and then there's, a, there's an ICLR runtime host two because there was a runtime host one and that's basically how they do versioning. Um, at the end of it, your code's running. So that's the startup, uh, that's a demo. Okay, so on to initialization. So the part of that startup was actually initializing the CLR itself. Um, and there's a lot it has to do. Um, set up, initialization, start up, start the main components, and then the final step. So there's a whole lot of components the runtime needs itself. It kind of has its own data structures for um, just general housekeeping. It has its own, you know, it has to start up the JIT. It has to load DLLs. There's a lot of stuff it has to do first. Um, and then on top of that, it's got its own logging. It's got its own um, error reporting. You know, if you've ever got the, uh, what is it, internal internal CLR runtime exception or something like that. There's, you know, there's something going on in the runtime to make sure that if it goes wrong, it gives you something that makes sense back in terms of what you understand. So it's got error catching, error handling going on there, and it um, can throw out errors in uh, .NET exception errors. Um, it starts up a lot of co um, components, so uh, profiling API, debugging is started up, or it's able to, you, that's what allows you to attach a debugger after you started, or you can obviously um, run with the debugger attached if you want to. Um, it then starts up some of the bigger components, so GC, app domain, actually not multiple app domains. And then at the end of it, it basically sends out a thing saying, I'm, I'm done, I'm ready to go. And that, at that point, code can start executing. Um, I've simplified it a bit. There's actually, well, when I wrote the post, 68 things, um, <laughs> give or take. But anyway, there's a lot going on there. And this is why uh, sometimes .NET doesn't look good in sort of small benchmarks, right? That's why to print Hello World, there's, I mean, I think I was running .NET Run, which does compile and all that sort of stuff, so that was a bad case. But even if you just uh, run a simple Hello World app, it's probably going to be slower than a Go Hello World app or a C++ Hello World app because they don't have all this overhead. So something to bear in mind if you're ever doing that kind of type of benchmarks. That, uh, and, it, and it probably plays a bit in microservices where you want to spin something up quickly. Um, and I know they've done some work to try and cut this down. They have rules about what can happen in this path because this, this is blocking any of our code executing. This has to happen first. They have rules about what can happen there. Um, we're going to look at a tool called Perfu in just a second. Um, actually, before that, first of all, has, has anyone heard of Perfu? A few people. Has anyone used Perfu? Less people. <laughs> it's, you'll see in a minute why maybe that's um, the case. But before that, we're just going to look at flame grass because I'm going to show it's the one exciting demo bit, demoable bit of Perfu. Um, but if you haven't come across flame grass before, they're a bit confusing. So we're going to see a chart that looks a bit like this one here with teeth and bites and whatever. They're generally or most often used to show um, CPU usage, where time was spent. And if you imagine a sampler taking a stack trace, say once every millisecond, and then you kind of, you know, so you run your program for 10 seconds, whatever, you take, them every, and then you put them all together. So the first thing to remember about flame grass is it's not like it started on the left and it's over time. It's all of the stuff that happened in the whatever time you were collecting it, then put back together. Um, but where you have samples that end up in the same stack trace, you have a wider block. That's what that's talking about. So the main, in this case, it's main animal or whatever. But anyway, our main uh, entry point function will be 100% because that's where we spent our whole time. So the entry point function to the CLR. But as we see um, blocks going up, that's the different call stacks. And what you're basically looking for is big wide blocks. That's where you're showing that function and its children. But as they tail off, that's you know, the call stack going further and further down. So uh, what you tend to do if you're doing it for performance things is you would, uh, is this gonna work? In this case, you would look at the byte because there's a lot of time spent in byte, but not its children. So if this was a performance one, you'd think, okay, that's saying I can optimize byte. Teeth's a bit harder because actually the time's split between things and you have to work out to about what these blocks are and then it, you know. But byte's an obvious one, because you can see 20% of the time is spent in byte, but nothing in its children. So if we're talking functions in a, in a stat trace, as opposed to animals. Um, 
just a tip if you've not read uh, Julia Evans's, I don't know why I put it sideways to make you look, but anyway, her, the blog jvns.ca is, is worth a look. Um, she does a lot of this um, zine, zines, explaining concepts in this kind of way, really approachable stuff if you want to learn. And, and this is like, she covers everything, networking, um, uh, yeah, go, go and check it out at some point. It's worth checking out. So uh, let's just... Let's do that first, so I've remembered. Let's flick over to Perfue. So this is what you're presented with when you see Perfue. And this is why about 50% of people who've heard of Perfue don't get any further. <laughs> it's not the most uh, easy tool. There's some good tutorials, and it is worth digging into, because there's some stuff it can give you, although a lot of the commercial tools use the same mechanism. So it's built, uh, largely built on top of something called ETW, events, event tracing for Windows, or well, there's now a cross-platform version in the .NET Core world because it's not a Windows, but anyway, it's been around in .NET framework. And it's collecting these events. You can actually write code that collects these events yourself, but what Perfue does is um, aggregates them up, it downloads the symbols, so you get better stack traces and a whole lot of other stuff. So um, it also will do a bit of high-level analysis on those events if they're GC pauses and things like that. So it's, it's, it's more than just collecting the raw events. Um, but you run it up, um, as I'll see in a second. So you run up a command, and if I've got the right one from before, I'm running, um, when I showed the sample um, hosting application, there's actually one that comes with, if you build the runtime yourself, there's one called Core One, which is a more complex one. So I'm using that but I'm running my same Hello World program, if you can see that here. Uh, you can't, um, there we go. There's no, there's no responsive UI in Perfue. I'm limited to zooming in to the screen. But anyway, you, you run it up. Um, I will very briefly show you the advanced options again. Um, <laughs> yeah, make of that what you want. Uh, I, I uh, get confused because if you see there's three there that mention .NET allocations. You've got .NET alloc, .NET sample alloc, ETW .NET alloc, uh, and GC only and GC, anyway. Um, it takes a little while to find your way around at all, let's say that. But um, it's widely used by Microsoft engineers who work on the .NET runtime and other tooling. Um, and I'm pretty sure I've seen people um, on your team and other people on the project system running ETW traces to find out where things are being slow. So it's a pretty powerful tool. Uh, as I said, a lot of the commercial tools will give you some uh, of the things that you get this. It tends to be that um, when they bring out a new um, feature in the runtime, they'll make sure it works in Perfue first because they use it themselves for diagnosing. So like tier compilation, it's a new thing in the .NET Core 2 uh, that we're going to talk about at the end of this talk. Um, they made sure there's events being published and, and uh, Perfue understands those events and knows how to interpret them. So. But we'll get on to the uh, demo. Um, so you run a command and it does that because it's perfume. Um, and it does horrible things with windows that flip around. But anyway, you can just about see that it is running the hello world command amongst all the other stuff it's doing. Um, and we'll give it a few seconds to finish off. Um, yeah. I think it's fair to say it's a UI written by an engineer. Um, but what it's doing, you can sort of see in the text output, is enabling all the ETW providers. At the end of it, it's doing something called rundown. It's getting all um, symbols. It's merging it. Basically, it's doing all this so that you can do analysis on one machine. Sorry, you can collect it on one machine and do analysis on another. So Perfue um, is designed to be run for limited periods in production. I don't think you want to turn it on all the time, but the, the use case behind it is actually for you know, constrained periods that run it against your production server for 30 seconds. Please don't go away and do that on your live production system without testing on another system first, but it is something that it was built for. The, the events that it collects and uses are, uh, on Windows at least, uh, provided by the OS. So they're as lightweight and as um, efficient as can be. Um, but at the end of that, you get um, perfume data files, and there's a few things you get, but you get CPU stacks. And it makes you, it collects system-wide, so you have to select thing, and I have to do this because I run it with local PDBs. And let's just keep pressing yes. 
eventually you get this really <laughs> useful UI. But uh, let's ignore that. Um, it's a whole talk to explain what's going on there, but this is the flame graph. Let's make it bigger and let's start to show you a few things. So I'm gonna just, you can filter it again. The filtering is, <coughs> the filtering is literally regexes, right? So um, I, I've tried to write my own ones and they never work, but you can filter. I just didn't choose the right one. Um, so at this point, we can actually see something meaningful. So we're starting to see, so remember, this is the whole time of that application. I ran a simple Hello World application, right? It's not doing a lot, but it does start to show you the reason it's quite nice of running a Hello World because we're not doing much in user code. So we're just seeing what the runtime does, which is why I did that demo that way. So system private core lib, um, can you see the tooltips just about? Um, we're starting to see, this is the C-sharp code I was talking about, the, the um, part of the runtime. It's got something called the pre-stub, which is what um, starts up our code, and we'll get into that on jitting. Uh, here we're starting to see the Hello World, and this is the code of the Hello World program, and the call stack there, and it calls into um, console.write line, and then we've got a private method in there, and you can go and see more, and you've got more. Uh, here we've got, what we've got going on here, that's the host starting itself up, and then I think over here we've got create app domain. Now, just in case you didn't see that at all, I've got, um, here's one I prepared earlier, uh, in true Blue Peter style for anyone that makes sense to. Um, so they tend up looking a bit like this, but this is what it is annotated. So we've got the app domain set up, as I said, app domains, uh, as a concept have gone away, but there's one still started up in the runtime, so that's the chunk of time in the middle. Again, this is not left to right, this is overall time where the stacks were found at sampling. Um, a whole load of time spent jitting and running the code in the Hello World, and then the EE startup, um, that corresponds to the list I gave you before of the uh, 68, that, that, that slide with the 68 things the runtime does, that's the runtime starting itself up. So this startup, you know, Compared to a Hello World, the startup is not great, right? It's more time doing that. But in all other situations, we, we pay that cost once and then it, it kind of goes away. We obviously pay the cost of jitting every time. Every method that we want to be run has to be jitted once. Um, so that's fixed per method, if you like. Or not, sorry, not fixed. We have to pay that every time we want to run a method. But this cost of app domains and, and um, runtime setting itself up is we only pay that cost once. Um, and interestingly enough, by randomly doing that and putting on Twitter, you find a bug in the runtime. <laughs> well, actually, I didn't know I found it. Someone saw my tweet and realized they found it. But anyway, uh, this is what I was hinting at before. So um, Event Controller is the cross-platform way of doing this. Um, and they want to make sure that things like that don't block the startup path. And by seeing my tweet, they found out that basically uh, some of those things shouldn't have been in the startup path and they actually fixed it. So that's quite a nice uh, accidental thing that I did by, I wish I'd known it and I could have gone to them, but I'll take it still. Um, I kind of got the credit. But the point is they try to push as much outside of that startup path as possible. Um, and the other part, the other main thing going on um, at that time with a lot of allocations, by far the largest memory allocations are the GC. Um, but it does a lot of stuff around reserving memory rather than committing it. So it reserves large amounts of memory, but only commits it as needed. So you, you kind of have to be a bit careful when you're looking in, say, Procmon or one of those tools that gives you the memory to understand it. And I would explain to you it by always getting the wrong around. You can look it up online. But the point is, is the GC is smart, right? It, it allocates uh, the big heaps that it needs, you know, the 4 gig or the six, 4 gig, uh, yeah, for 64-bit <coughs> server. Um, and then some of this is per CPU as well, so these numbers start to add up. So it, it allocates that in terms of address space, but only commits chunks of it as it's actually used by our code, basically. Um, uh, yeah, so, and, and, and by far, more often than not, by far the largest memory usage in an application will be the GC heaps that's uh, being provided by the runtime for our code. There is some memory the runtime itself allocates uh, outside of managed memory, um, but that's rarely the largest amount, certainly not in a, in, when it's a problem. Okay, so on to the uh, type loader. So if we wrote code like this, uh, we would get that compiler error at the bottom, right? So we're, we're newing up an abstract class. You can't do that, right? That's, that's enforced. That's, 
Um, so we'd get that in VS Code, wherever we were doing it, right? We'd see that error. But there's, there's nothing to stop you um, writing some IL code uh, that, that breaks this, that doesn't um, enforce that, and then passing it to the runtime. So the runtime has to do these same checks. It can't rely on everyone being nice and only compiling with nice compilers. There's various ways. I mean, you can, you can use, uh, people heard of the tool ILDASM? Yeah, so you can, you can take any .NET DLL that's been compiled to IL. You can run ILDASM that disassembles it. It gives you the text, a .IL file. You could modify that file, and then you could use ILASM that, that compiles it back, and then you could pass it to the runtime. So there's no guarantees, and this is actually where all the IL files in the runtime testing are. They're these sort of scenarios, right? Bad scenarios. So the runtime has to do type checks. Every time we load a type, part of the type system guarantees are that we can't do things like this. We can't without using reflection, access private members, all the sorts of things we take for granted. We've got encapsulation, we've got um, objects, and you know those kind of things that we rely on in our code. We program against interfaces versus implementation, all that, that type sort of stuff. So the runtime provides this. Um, so it has to do these checks, right? I think that's hopefully making sense that the, the, the runtime itself has to check every type that's been loaded to check it doesn't make any, have any issues. Has anyone uh, written any code like this? Uh, we've got mutually recursive generic constraints. There you go. I have to write that down, sorry, Embra. It's crazy code. I've, I've yet, I've, if anyone could come up to me afterwards and give me a real life scenario where you could meaningfully change class A, class B, class C to real names and show me why this should be code. I'd love to see it. I've not yet had anyone do that. It's weird code, right? Because you've got C is, uh, class A is generic in C of B. Anyway, it hurts my head trying to explain it. I'm not a <laughs> compiler person, but you can kind of see there's weirdness going on. And the point is, is that these classes are all dependent on each other. A shouldn't load if B is broken because B is generic in A. B shouldn't load if A is broken because vice versa. And you kind of got a weird thing there. Which one do you load first? They should only both load if they're both okay. They should neither of them load if either of them are broken. So thinking on the previous example, if one of those classes is badly constructed because someone's done something wrong with IL, the compiler would never do that. But if someone had been messing around, whatever, a tool maybe, um, the runtime has to think about things like this. And, it's, and with generics and generic um, classes that inherit from other generic classes and all the nonsense that's going on here, it makes it even more complex. So the runtime has to work through, all that's building up to say, the runtime has to work through a quite complex step. It has to work through stuff in stages because it can't fully load a type until it knows all its dependent types are okay. But we've just seen a recursive example there with A and B, neither of them can load till the other one's loaded. You can't load one without the other. So it kind of works through these steps and it's a bit like um, my basic understanding of transactions in the, in the database. They try and run everything, and at the point when they know everything's okay, they just then like, flip, flip a bit, say, yes, this transaction's done. Because you, know, you, you want the trans transactions guaranteed that they all complete or nothing completes. So you run through, but if it goes wrong partway through, you actually need to roll it back. So it's the same sort of idea. It has to go through these steps, and it has to load all the classes at the first level, and then load all the classes at the second level, and you can kind of see some of them are um, unrestored parent. They talk about approximate parents, exact parents. So they're doing checks. So this class can only progress if its parents have loaded. That class can only progress if its parents have loaded, and that's how they deal with it. And again, all this is basically summing up saying, we just write class foo, struct bar. We inherit for another class. We implement an interface. We just do all this, right? The runtime does a lot to make that work and work consistently. Because we're in a managed runtime, we have certain expectations about this, about you know, private fields, about uh, implementations, all this sort of stuff. Um, and this is the sort of thing it has to go through. And, and you can read the, the gory details in that post if you really want to at the bottom. So we've, we've, the runtime's loaded up types. Um, what it hasn't yet done, if we're going through in, in order, which this is, is it hasn't actually run any of our code. So it's started itself up, it's loaded up types and classes, it does all that first to get those ready. And finally, we come on to JIT compilation. And that progresses a bit like this. Um, this is the, um, what things look like before JITing. So you might have heard in, in JIT compilation, 
well, let's, let's explain a few things. It's just in time compilation in that it will only compile the method when we actually call it, right? So if there's a piece of code that you, there's two different types of compile, it does get a bit confusing. You've compiled your code in Visual Studio, VS Code, wherever. That code lives in a DLL. You run that code. At runtime, that code is then compiled by the JIT compiler, but only when you actually call those methods. So if one method in there is never called, it won't get JIT compiled. But it does mean that on startup, generally, you have a kind of cascading effect. Method A calls method B, calls method C. That causes those to JIT. Method A can't run until method B has been JITted, which can't, you know. And it does this with a, something called stubs. And they sit in between the method invocation. So the code, if we take the example method A, method B, keep it simple, method A will have a call to method B. The first time that call happens, it will go through, sorry, th this is what's wired up before that happens. So it has a few steps in the way um, after jitting it's changed. So the first time, it basically we end up in something called the pre-stub and then the pre-stub work. And the pre-stub work is actually a bit of C++ code um, in the runtime. And it deals with a few things, a bit of housekeeping, and then it hands off to the JIT and says, right, I'd like you to compile this method. And this is where we have like the different parts of the runtime. So the VM, that red square at the beginning, then calls into the JIT and says, right, here's the method, here's the IL code, here's I want it optimized or not unoptimized, a few other options it gives it, and then the JIT will hand back the address of the compiled code. Um, but it has this stub because it means that when the code's first called, the stub redirects it off to the worker that does the work there. But you don't want that to happen the second time, right? The second time the method's called, you want to go straight to the actual compiled code. So that's what's going on here. So it's rewritten the pre-code fix-up to point into the native code. And then for the runtime, for its own internal use, it, it does something called a stable entry point via another pre-code fix-up. And that means that from that point onwards, anything that wants to call this method can just go to the stable entry point, literally a call assembly instruction to the stable entry point. The pre-code fix-up is a whole other topic on its own, but what that's basically doing is there's times in the runtime where we have things like virtual method dispatch, methods that go through, it's where the method isn't known until runtime and it has to go through an extra layer of indirection. Um, I cover that in another talk, I'm not gonna go into it now, but um, if you'd like to know a bit more about that, afterwards come and chat to me and I'll point you in the right direction where you can find out more. But anyway, think of it as another level of indirection where um, it might need to direct it in two different ways. Um, that's, that's what it's looked like uh, all the way through .NET. If we're talking about jitted code, I know there's things like NGEN where you can um, compile your code uh, um, up front so it doesn't go through this, but generally we go through this path. Um, but what it looked like with tier compilations, the tier compilation came out in .NET core two time frame. Um, I think it was 2.1 where it was enabled by default. And it's trying to do something a bit different. So the problem with, the main issue with JIT compilation is that you have this problem on startup. Method A calls method B calls method C. Method A can't run until all these other methods. So you might have seen this for slow startup times. Maybe you've seen this yourself in um, some of your applications. Um, and it's particularly an issue with microservices where it's basically blocking the time, it's the time to first request, right, which is a, an important metric. So when you spin up your microservice, um, your, if your first request takes a lot longer, that's probably an issue. So that's the problem with tier compilation is that um, all this stuff gets in the way. Sorry, that's the problem before tier compilation. So tier compilation is trying to solve that problem by saying a few things. One is that um, the reason that takes a long time is because um, when we're jitting a method, we want to make the best version of that method on this because in, in before tier compilation, the, the, the JIT compiler had one chance to JIT the method. It had to do it and it had to make the most efficient version because that was, that co that was the code that was going to run for that method's lifetime. That method could be called tens of thousands of times. So the JIT would do as much work as it could to make sure that's the most efficient version. CPU intrinsics, um, trying to get rid of dead code if it was there, trying to inline methods, all the sorts of stuff that the JIT compiler does. The problem is that takes time. So that's blocking the method being called the first time. So tier compilation tries to break that apart and says, right, let's do something different. Let's JIT compile the method the first time in the most simple way. Let's just do the most basic compilation. Let's not do any of those tricks. Let's just get a version out there. But let's do something a bit different. And that's what comes in here. Is it um, through the uh, fix up, 
it's keeping a counter. And what it's saying is actually, we don't care about optimizing methods until they've been called a lot of times. Because if a method's going to be called once, does it really matter if it runs in eight milliseconds versus 10? Probably not. If it's called 10,000 times, it starts to matter. If it's called 1,000 times a second, it really does matter. So it's, it's uh, putting in a counter. Uh, that's what the tier compilation does. And uh, last time I checked, it was once it had been called 30 times. They may have put some more um, different heuristics. But the idea is that once that method's considered hot or important, um, let's have another go. And at this point, you've got the unoptimized version running. So you're not blocked, right? You don't have to take less time because that code's already running. It's not the best version, but it's running. So what it does on the background thread is it, optim it runs the, well, it runs what it always ran before, but in the future it can run more advanced optimizations because it's, it's not blocking the method. Um, and then you end up uh, with the redirections, and that's part of why the pre-code fix-ups go. That's one of the things they do is redirect to different places. So first time it goes through the counter, and then when that's done, when there's a new version, it publishes it and, and rewrites the fix-up to point to the optimized version. And it still has the original one. Um, in theory, you could do things like go back to that one if the optimizations were bad. It doesn't do that at the moment, but that's what it's opening up, the kind of ideas. So that's, that's the basics of um, what tier compilation does. If you're running under .NET Core, definitely 3 um, and I think 2.2, .2, this is turned on by default. This is happening. Um, it does make it a bit confusing for people doing benchmarks because it's not something we've had to worry about so much in .NET, but it does mean that you now have to run your method about 30 times before you see the optimized version. So um, it's just something to bear in mind. But there is tooling, Perfume, and other tooling will tell you um, at that point, which version of the method it is. So we're on to the final bits. We've seen our code done just for the last two minutes. We're going to go through everything else. Well, in, in this example, it's actually just um, printing console, printing Hello World to the screen, right? Um, that, that there's, there's, um, so that is pinvoke. Um, probably all familiar with pinvoke or you know, DLL import, the attributes you put. It's a way to call from managed code out to native code. Now, the large parts of the runtime are implemented in native code. So it kind of has, it's a bit different internally, but basically it has the same idea of p-invoke because it's having to cross from the boundary of managed to unmanaged. It's having to make sure, for instance, if that code throws an exception, it captures it and turns it into a .NET exception that we can catch in our own code. And there's a few other things. It has to marshal data types look different. A string in .NET looks different than a string in C++, all that sort of stuff. That's what's going on there. So for the, um, for the console one, so we've got, this is all the methods that were jitted in one run of the Hello World. But you can see a lot of them are these dynamic class IL stub P invoke. And you can kind of see, so it, um, I think the console overload, console right line, it takes two ints or an int, anyway. There's a few, it's hard to tell exactly which one came from ours, but the, the stubs are shared. So, any two functions that, that call a function with an int can share the same stub. So there's other, it's hard to just isolate them to our code. But the point is for the, for the hello world, uh, sorry, for the console write line, if you look in the code, that's actually implemented as a native call to the um, underlying OS, you know, that writes to the terminal and I think it's C++ library code. Um, so the runtime is, is basically creating these stubs um, as I said, they're shared where they can be, uh, but one of those will be the one for our console right line calls. Uh, I think the other ones come from setting up the output and a few other things. You can, you can look into the code. But anyway, that's what's going on there. So at, at this point, we actually get Hello World printed onto the screen. We finally, we finally got to the end of it all. Um, I did say, didn't I? 45 minutes. Okay, about on. Right, so that's, uh, that's a... Uh, a taste of what the runtime does, to be fair. That's quite a lot. I mean, it does that every time we run our code, but there's still a lot of other stuff. Um, I've written about other bits on my um, blog. If you're interested in this, there's more stuff in there. There's tools for exploring it yourself, presentations other people have done covering this sort of stuff. Um, if you're a tool wanting to look into this yourself, one of the really best places to start is this book of the runtime uh, down the bottom there. Uh, that's now slash runtime. They've, it will redirect you anyway. If you go there, you'll find the right place. But um, the book of the runtime is the internal documentation written by the Microsoft runtime engineers for other runtime engineers. And I say that because it means that it's, 
it's not an easy first read. About five or six of my blog posts have been me reading a book of the runtime page, not understanding much of it, going away, doing a bit of research, coming back, reading a bit more, repeat 10 times, and eventually I understand enough. To... So it's, if you're a runtime engineer, it's probably pretty obvious. If you're not, which is the rest of us, um, it takes a bit of getting into. But it is the definitive. They've, the, the pages in there are kept reasonably up to date. They add new pages as they add new features to the runtime. There's other, under the um, documentation folder as well, there's other um, parts. The book of the runtime is more core runtime, so it's worth checking out the other parts of the run, uh, documentation because they do uh, flag up. So tier compilation, the design doc was written for it about six months before the code appeared. Uh, sorry, before it appeared in .NET Core. So if you're looking to see some of the stuff that's coming along or see how some of the new features are designed. Um, so that, uh, that is it for the talk. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.